Welcome everyone and thank you for the interest in the topic of open source security. The last year has been a year full of events and it has been a challenge to bring a summary of all of that to you in 30 minutes. So before I start talking about actual events, let's talk about the structure of the talk. I will be covering long-term trends and the shorter events that happened in the last year. Those are things that I have seen and noticed myself, but I had to do selection. So if I missed something that is important to you, sorry, talk to me, I can add it to a different version of this presentation later. My main sources for, uh, for this talk, not a big surprise, LWNet, or, uh, or various mailing lists, security and announcements, social media, open SF, SF channels, and I'm not able to count every single one of them. If you have something to add to this talk, do not hesitate to contact me because there is so much that happened. Now, why am I talking about this subject and knowing more about me allows you to see what I selected to the talk. Um, I've, it has been more than 20 years in open source. I have PhD in security actually. I've been doing network security, uh, low level software, but have been also involved in higher level uh, software, I have been a uh, vice president and treasurer for KDEEV, the organization behind the desktop environment. Um, currently, I'm contributing to uh, projects from Foundation Eclipse to the Yocta project, Linux kernel from time to time, and I'm a, a security team member for Eclipse Foundation. And um, I'm also teaching we, we have an uh, embedded uh, security course running, uh, writing newsletters about security events and uh, consulting in various um, projects related to embedded security. He, uh, on the slide, you have my contact information uh, with my uh, family name spelled correctly, but everyone just calls me Marta, so this, it's easy. So. Think a few seconds what was the most important cybersecurity news for you in the last year. I'm not going to ask the audience, but think, think about it. In fact, I did a poll in the recent weeks. I had to choose options. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, do a um, a poll to let people fill in, and what turned out is that most of the people chose the option that made the news, the big Windows crash that touched uh, a lot of things. And way less people, but still nearly the majority, have chosen the XZ accident, and then the two other options were even way less. So, I'm going to start with the CV NVD story to convince you that in the long term, it is one of the most important events that we have had. But to cover what happened with CVs and NVD, we need to we need a little bit of context. So. What is CV? CVE, also called Common Vulnerability Enumeration, is a database. It's a database of known vulnerabilities. And it has data from 1999. Um, as it is a 25 years plus old project, there were multiple formats of the database over the years. And what is important to know is that the CVE has a kind of a decentralized format. The entities that are assigning 
those IDs are called CNAs, and only the CNA that is taking care of a given project can assign a CV in that project. So you need to go to the right CNA to get an entry for, for, for a project or to have that entry changed. And until recently, that may be shocking in 2024, but until recently, the CV database didn't have a machine-readable uh, vendor and product information. And how such an entry looks like, like this. That's a pretty old one from 2009. So what we can see that we have a sentence saying that DTLS buffer record function uh, in a given file in the OpenSSL 098K and earlier 098 have something and we get a description of what the problem was. So we can extract the information about which project it was and which version it was um, if we have five to do, if we have 5,000 to do, well, it's not that funny. So, because there was no machine-readable information in the CV database, and for other reasons too, um, there's a second database called NVD, National Vulnerability Database. The national means US national, because both are handled by US uh, uh, bodies and what NVD does, they take the CVE entry and they add information. They add information about the product vendor and versions that are affected and they add information about the severity of the vulnerability. And the, that's the NVD data that is used for most vulnerability scanning, both, both commercial and open source. So that's why quite often people talk about both of them together. And how it looks like in a visualization, the same CV, you have the same text. And then we have the metrics information, so we have the vector, we learned that the severity is five out of 10, so it's not that serious. And we have the known affected software configurations. So it's from 098, up till 098M. And this is given in a machine readable format so we can write software that is comparing what we have installed to the vulnerable version. And that was how the vulnerability scanning world was working for a long time. Until February 24. Because for mysterious reasons, which are still not very clear until now, the NVD stopped adding new entries around February 12. This is still not, very, not that clear what happened. And the NVD stopped adding new entries, but the CVs were still assigned. So there were new vulnerabilities that were being discovered. The CV database was still growing but not much was happening at the NVD side. And it has restarted later in the spring, but it's still pretty slow. On the CV program side, in 2024, there were also changes that happened. Um, we have multiple new CNAs, so those bodies that can assign vulnerabilities. We have the Linux kernel, but we have curl, we have quite many, and in the last batch, just the last few weeks, for example, Wiki Media Foundation. But as a context, most of the big open source foundations or big open source projects were already CNAs before. So there are actually not many left who are not. And the CV program has been rolling out the new format, JSON version 5, that gives you an idea how many versions there were over the years, and it's JSON. So 
it means that quite likely we can process it automatically. The consequences of the whole NVD story and drama, the first big question the develop, security developers mostly started asking themselves, uh, how do we assure that we do have an open source vulnerability database? We realized that we were dependent on a single vendor solution over which we had no control and we couldn't just update those data. And there was, for a, for a period of time, a real risk that the only thing that we we'll have left will be commercial vendors. That was not a very uh, pleasant situation for the open source community. Now, and how we do assure that the entries of, uh, of the database are machine readable? Uh, there are new legislations, we are going to talk about it. They practically force us to do automatic processings. Uh, and with a few uh, CNAs, um, the, the people related to them are not in this talk, but they have a talk uh, just after. Uh, with the new CNAs, um, we are getting more entries and we are facing a potential scalability problem. Because not all projects are assigning CVs and most of the project, if they followed the way Linux kernel does it, would generate way, way, way more. So how do we handle the potential number of CVs we may be getting every day, basically? And then should we build a different database or should we fix what exists? Um, and here the situation is not very clear right, right now. We have a data, uh, alternative databases like OSV that is growing, but the problem is that in practice it's a single vendor database again. We have GitHub advisories, same problem. And we have the legislation that mandates country or regional databases. There's Siri in Europe, there's a database in China. I'm not sure how it's in Japan, but quite likely something is also happening. Uh, so we may end up with multiple databases. So what is the current situation? The backlog of NVD is still there. They didn't manage to clean up the backlog uh, since February. Uh, the CV program has sent big messages to all CNAs to encourage them to encode machine and, uh, the, the product uh, and version in the entry in the new format they can, and there is no excuse not to do it. The uh, CV data is available on GitHub. The JSON files are on GitHub. Uh, but you can, if you find something that you would like to fix in an entry, you cannot do a pull request. You need to find the contact information on the right CNA and go ask them and maybe they will do the change. Uh, and still there are unfortunately many NA vendors and product that's fr that frustrates me uh, a little bit. So, um, as I do not want to do the whole talk about the CVs, um, I prepared you some additional readings too. There's the new section of the NVD website when you have the press releases as, as the story uh, followed. And Patrick Garrity um, has a nice coverage with statistics about how many, um, how many entries ha have been processed during that time. Okay, we'll, we'll change a little bit the topic right now to programming languages and compilers. You have heard that the work on Rust in the Linux kernel continues, so I'm not going really to cover it that much. If you look what will be there in 6.12, uh, there will be security features for Rust. Um, 
access to new data structures and, uh, and many more things. The kernel work is getting the news, but it's not the only place when the move to memory safe languages happens. Um, CISA, the American Cybersecurity Agency, has been pushing strongly for memory safe languages. Uh, they have done a um, big message, urgent need for memory safety uh, in, uh, in, in products. And some projects are just working on it. Um, Android has been working on moving to memory safe languages since um, 2019. And they have recently published a blog about the number of memory uh, related bugs they get since they started adding memory safe languages and different techniques to uh, to work on those problems, and they have already reduced the number of bugs they are getting by a significant factor. It's a pretty interesting read on how, how they approach the, the situation. We have the memory safe languages, but um, I came to a realization recently when I was trying to write a buffer overflow for uh, teaching purposes. I was trying to write a buffer overflow code in C uh, for my classes. And in fact, that's pretty complicated right now. The GCC compiler in the recent versions is actually trying to force you actually not to do it. There are warnings. If you enable warnings at Teros, you, of course, you get even more. And for example, the, um, there are improvements quite recent improvements, even more. In GCC 14, in the static uh, memory analyzer, uh, it can detect certain infinite loops. Uh, it can vi even visualize uh, certain buffer overflows. And it's mi it, can, uh, it can detect missing data sanitization. I give you a link to the blog post that describes the options on how to use it. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, another, another the funny, the funny, uh, funny subject. Um, this legislation. Um, I will talk only about the CRA because that's the one that I know best, but similar legislation is coming in different places. So, uh, yeah, talking CRA uh, 13, uh, 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 at the distance of 13, uh, hours flight uh, from Paris, but uh, there, is, there is a reason to do so. Uh, the CRA is a new regulation in Europe that adds mandatory security requirements for all products sold in Europe. Um, for all con connected or possibly connected products, hardware and software, and it applies it will apply to every single product sold in Europe. So it, for a product that is designed in Japan, manufactured in Japan, but sold in Europe, it applies. Um, and it works as an extension on the CE marking, so the basic el electrical safety s extension. They have extended the, the marking to include cybersecurity. What will vendors have to do is the self-assessment by default, uh, except if you fall into the list of products that are on two lists, other important or critical products. And uh, the list of requirements is pretty long. I'm just uh, doing a few examples. So uh, probably the most important from the user's point of view is an obligation to offer security updates of all products for the whole durations of the support period. So the manufacturer will have to define a support period which is a minimum of five years and will have to offer so, uh, security updates free of charge. And it's clearly written free of charge in the legislation. Um, 
and it is up to the manufacturer to handle all issues, even if they have taken a library, the bug is in the library, it's up to the manufacturer to fix that library. Um, this obligation of due diligence, so you need to know what you put into the product, and you, um, it, the obligations are on the manufacturer, and there's also obligations to report security incidents if there's remote processing. The timeline is that the, uh, the law is expected to be published as the last, last step uh, in November, and then there will be full entry into, the, in, into force three years from that moment. Uh, on our side, on the open source side, what, uh, what is there? Um, there have been quite many modifications from the moment uh, we started talking about this array. In the final version, there is a protection of developers. If you are just a contributor to an open source project, there are no obligations on you. The obligations are on those who monetize the product, and only on them. And there are two categories, there are more, but I'm simplifying, manufacturers who monetize, and they have four obligations, and there are stewards, uh, stewards who support open source projects, typically foundations, but not only, and then uh, they will have obligations on making sure there are processes in place in the open source project, and eventually uh, talk with market surveillance uh, bodies if they have questions about related to, uh, to a breach of vulnerability. So that's going to, uh, to, to have impact, mm -hmm. and of course it's not only that. Um, open source right now is too big to be forgotten by legislators, and we have just had another example <laughs> with the Linux kernel and the famous removal of uh, certain maintainers. Uh, open source has grown too big so that we cannot assume that we can hide, nobody is going to see us and we, we can work as before. No, we are too big and the legislators know it. Um, on the series side, uh, we have three years. Three years is not really that short. Uh, there are initiatives to work the open source way on the required paperwork and requirements and standards. If you are affected, most of you are, uh, it's a good thing to get involved uh, into that work. So, um, we have seen a lot of changes in security, um, and we have, when we see a lot of changes and development, it also likely means money. Um, in the recent years, we have seen ways to fund security work. Uh, two notable examples, the Alpha Omega project and the Sovereign Tech Fund, uh, the German fund, but giving, um, uh, giving grants to projects all around the world. They have just closed a call for grants for maintainers. And the, apart from the hired positions for the freelance, there were no require, any requirements on the place where, where the person is. But uh, that was before the recession, all of that. So the question is now with bu budget, different budget cuts, how it's going to happen and will, will the, there be resources to continue uh, the important security work, the work that has been um, there for the, for the last years? It's a big open question. Okay, uh, then the S-bombs. Uh, on the S-bomb software beam of material side, uh, we have seen two of the main standards, so SPDX and Cyclone DX, having their new versions in April this year. SPDX 3, it's a practical rewrite of the standard. It's way more modular. 
and it, ha it has its own vulnerability reporting standard in it. Uh, Cyclone takes its more adjustments, uh, but they are also working on making it um, standardized. The SBOM generation is growing, and that's enough to look uh, on the agenda of the conference to be convinced by that. Uh, on the other hand, the usage, so verification, conversion, merging of multiple SBOMs generated by different tools, um, I would prefer this to be advancing faster than it actually is. Hope, hoping for 2025. Okay, now uh, I have a few minutes to cover the most important uh, incidents. Um, the EXE, uh, that has been um, covered a lot. So, little no library, but used uh, all around the place. With a two years long social engineering attack, uh, the attackers uh, got co-maintenance status, then co co uh, he have hidden uh, backdoors in test files, in binary test files, and it was detected in the last moment, just before the affected versions being pulled in into the main distributions. Um, we, ha we are seeing here, yet again, the same pattern. Um, projects with one maintainer and uh, little known and very frequently used project that uh, di different kind of issue, but that reminds me very much of Log4j at, uh, at this aspect. In both cases, projects that you wouldn't consider as a security risk, but it turned to be. So the big question, how do we establish trust for developers? They are ideas of verifying identity of developers um, and, and all the ideas that, that are flowing around. Not everyone agrees, for example, to uh, to necessarily show their passport uh, before, before committing their project. There are even ideas like that. Uh, and then the CrowdStrike. Uh, so it affected Windows, so, uh, so we don't care. <laughs> um, think again. Um, that's true that they had also a Linux port and it, it didn't break. Um, we can say that we have better architecture um, because on Linux they use BPF and on Windows they use uh, Windows kernel hooks and uh, apparently it can crash. Uh, and then they used a rollout uh, to, uh, to different targets uh, versus the um, more reasonable uh, rollout schema. But uh, imagine a situation if the XZ wasn't detected at the point it was. Imagine XZ detected after it was pulled in into the main distributions. Then, if it were the case, we, get, we would have gotten news about a backdoor in uh, half of the SSH servers in the world. That would be, I, I, I see the, the question, we are going to get to questions in a moment. So can it, can something like that happen to open source? It could, potentially it could. For instance, I think we, uh, we were lucky, simply. Okay, the takeaways from today. Uh, there's a lot of happening in the field. Of course, I couldn't cover everything. On the technical subjects, we have the move to memory safe languages. We are the work of vulnerability databases and patching and updates and all that. And we are really seriously facing the difficulty of handling dependency trees and dependencies of dependencies and dependencies of dependencies of dependencies. 
and we cannot do it manually. On the less technical subjects, we have the legislations and the legislator, um, and we have the geopolitic risks that are there. So that will be the time for questions and comments that you may have. There's a person with the microphone. Thank you for your presentation today on the cloud strike incident. You labeled it the cloud strike instrument incident. Do you think it's shared responsibility between CloudStrike and Microsoft, or do you think it was primarily uh, the security vendor? Do you have a point of view? Uh, I have a point of view. Uh, Taking into account that I haven't used Windows for uh, <laughs> 15 years, 15 years. Um, so how they do it architecturally those days, I do not know. But from what I read, uh, the way CrowdStrike connects to the Microsoft APIs, that was far from ideal. And there were press releases. They were, um, they were putting the blame one, one, on, uh, one on another. Uh, so I would say that there's a, there are two parts of the story, uh, and the whole architecture wasn't great. If do we have a better architecture on the Linux side? Currently, I think we do. On 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 this element, so that's uh, that that's good on our, on our end. Yeah, another question. Yeah, it's kind of to the same thing. It's not just our architecture is different. Um, we have a heterogeneous makeup of distributions, which means that we have different update channels as well, um, which I mean, it's not perfect, um, but we do have different ways of looking at things. So it would unlikely to be everyone hit all at the same time, which means that people will find out. And we have, you know, again, our testing of how these things get rolled out is very different. So I'm not saying we are immune, but the heterogeneity that we have throughout the distros and our approach to channels of distribution, I think, is important too. Uh, def definitely, um, the, the Linux environment uh, is way more fragmented. We have different distributions. We have people who are building their own distributions. So. Um, when people are creating those distributions, they are testing way more configurations than just a few. So we are automatically testing more use cases. And for, uh, for XZ, uh, I've already shared that, uh, there were more places where it could have been detected. It broke the build for the Yocta project. But just, uh, just um, the maintainers didn't have time to look why. But it broke, so it wasn't it, it wasn't pulled in. Yeah, another question on that end. Thank you. And this is a question on the CRA. So, in your view, is it possible for an organization to both be a maintainer and a steward, or sorry, both be a manufacturer and a steward? So I'm not a lawyer, and I don't want to become one. I am one. Trust me, you don't. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I understand from the explanation from people who have written the CRA, pretty good source, uh, they are saying that you can't be one. You are uh, either a manufacturer or a steward, or you are none of those, and then you have no obligations. But is that true for one piece of software? And you, uh, okay. Uh, or if I have it for multiple pieces yeah, of software? Yeah. That, that's a very good question. That, uh, that, that, that is pretty clear also. Uh, you may be a manufacturer for one piece of software and a steward for another. And any possible combination. Thank you. Yes, one more question here. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, so you're talking about like the openness is, uh, H like issue with libxc, um, but there was actually a regression with the openness SSH version that affected quite a few servers for Linux and probably not FreeBSD or OpenBSD due to how it worked. So there actually was a major SSH uh, regression, uh, uh, arbitrary code execution vulnerability this year. Uh, you are talking about the regression yeah. uh, vulnerability. Yes, there was one. Yes. But the XZ was another attack. Well, you're saying, like, what if it happened? Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, the, uh, from what I recall, the regression, um, were, uh, the, the regression was just a bug. It was a memory a safety bug. What XZ was trying to introduce into, uh, to SSH was uh, um, RSA, I think it was RSA key built in that would allow uh, everyone with the private key, of course, that, uh, that corresponds to connect to any, uh, to any server running that library. So a little bit different type of vulnerability. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding if you, I would like to hear more of your thoughts around how to gain trust in like open source contributions because a lot of that discussion frustrates me a bit and I feel like there's a very corporate perspective on open source that doesn't really apply to real life. I would like to hear what you think could actually work. That's a very big question. I, I don't expect a solution to everything, but I think <laughs> you would be someone with a lot of knowledge and perspective on this that I would like to hear from. I'm a security person, so I do not trust even myself at 100%. Um, and um, I prefer to distribute risk. So what I do in my projects, uh, I do mandatory code review if we can do it at, for at least two people, at least two people. Uh, not depending on one person. The one person may break a leg, may have an accident, may, may be blackmailed to do something. If we depend on a single person, there, there is way more risk. If there are multiple people sharing the same responsibility, there's less risk. Uh, there's less burnout, so that works better for multiple uh, situations. Um, and how to know who is whom. Working with a person for a long time, in most cases it works. If if that person, if, if you can come from time to time to a conference to meet other people, uh, that, gives, that gives more trust. Um, we can also try to detect false profiles. For example, the, the profile of Jiatan uh, didn't have any other contribution anywhere. So that's, that's a warning sign. Typically, when someone is in open source projects, they at least ask questions, report bugs, do something else in different projects. So that was a little bit suspicious. So we can probably detect su such, uh, such suspicious things uh, when, when it happens uh, in a project. Um, there are also procedural things. For example, um, in Eclipse Foundation, there's a committee status and the person has to be voted in by, all, by peers. That requires a small proof of work, uh, good wor work that they have done in the past. And then they get all privileges. So we have solutions. The problem with XZ was that it was a one person project. And that was the core of the problem. And if there's just one person, well, there's a problem. Thank you so much. We have one more minute left. Will we manage with one more question? <laughs> <laughs> 
I will be brief. Do you think the CRA is enforceable? Um, it, it copy pastes a lot of from GDPR, and GDPR, GDPR has been enforced. Okay. Like these, the, these the, things about like the whole dependency chain, it seems lofty. Um, uh, uh, holding them fully accountable, and yet they don't control a lot of what they would uh, be a, a perf perfectly enforceable for every single product on the market. I don't think so. Uh, like with the GDPR. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We have reached end of the sessions. Thank you, everyone, very much. <laughs>